Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is a briefing from www.central-mosque.com about Uyghur Muslims and Islam in China. Before we get to the point of what is happening today and their people who are ethnically Uyghur and they're able to express themselves about their situation better than me. So what I will do is at the end of this presentation, I will tag along an interview. Uh, which you can hear inshallah to get to know from the natives uh, but what 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 I will do is before I tag that interview at the end is set the scene as to how Islam got to China and where we are today and talk about some of the terms and geography inshallah let's proceed so when I was growing up in Pakistan um, as you traveled Islamabad and um, to the north of Pakistan I wouldn't say it was common, but it was possible for you to see children, Chinese Muslim children in Darul Ulooms. And also, if you went to Raiwind, you saw Jamaats from China. Uh, so at that time, um, in the 80s, when I was, when I was young, basically, uh, the ethnic Muslims uh, were not financially independent. So a lot of them crossed the border, came into Pakistan, uh, either to study Islam in the Darul Ulooms in Pakistan. And remember in the 80s, I'm talking about, this is the time when there was the Afghan Jihad against the Soviets. Um, and also, uh, not only to learn Islam, but also because of economic reasons. So it wasn't, uh, as, again, I'm saying it wasn't common, but it was possible to see these Muslim children and the Chinese Muslims in, in Islamabad and north of Pakistan. Uh, what I do know of is the first time this became an issue is when Benazir Bhutto became the Prime Minister of Pakistan in the 90s. Uh, and the Chinese in return of for uh, doing financial, uh, providing financial assistance to Pakistan, uh, they asked um, for basically subsequent, uh, you know, governments before Benazir Bhutto, the Chinese were always asking for the border to be controlled and immigration, but Pakistanis generally turned a blind eye. What I know of, I remember um, when the internet started, we used to have bulletin boards. At that time, I read this story. Basically, the Chinese requested Benazir to curtail the access of these Chinese Muslims to Pakistan, uh, and Benazir en masse turned thousands of Chinese children. Um, who were in the bordering areas of Pakistan, they hounded these children up and they handed them back to China. Uh, and Allah knows best what the Chinese did, but I remember reading about it in a, in a, in an Islamic magazine in the early late 80s, early, early 90s, actually, Benazir government, that some of these Muslims were executed by the Chinese government. So since then, uh, you no longer saw from the 90s onwards in Pakistan, you never saw in the north of Pakistan or Islamabad uh, and the northern regions, you never saw these ethnically Chinese Muslims. What you see now today in Pakistan, because of the CPEC, uh, the Chinese corridor uh, in Pakistan, you see loads and loads of Chinese in Pakistan uh, once again. But these Chinese are not Chinese Muslims. They are actually Chinese non-Muslims, Han uh, who are actually come to for Pakistan as laborers or engineers and so on and so forth. So the mix in Pakistan today, and this is I'm talking about my own experience before I delve into the history of this, has completely changed. So 35, 40 years ago in Pakistan, you used to have Chinese Muslims. Now you also have Chinese, but these are Chinese non-Muslims in Pakistan. Let's now return to the topic uh, and talk about what is happening in China. There are regions across many countries, parts of Pakistan, parts of Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Mongolia, Afghanistan, parts of Iran even, which is called Turkistan. Turkistan in Farsi, the word means the, the land of the Turk people, right? So this part of China, which you see right here is called East Turkistan. So out of solidarity with these brothers, mashallah, we will call it East Turkistan. When it comes to China, China calls it an autonomous region. So this is one of the largest autonomous regions in China. Specifically, Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. So if you've grown up in Pakistan like me, we're used to calling this uh, area Xinjiang. Okay, so we call it Xinjiang. We didn't know about Turkestan that much. We always call it Xinjiang. We call it Chinese Muslims or Xinjiang Muslims and never called it Turkestan. But later on, when you know you grow up, you realize the politics of the whole situation. So we will call it East Turkestan. Sorry about that. Let me go back. So East Turkestan. So this part and also throughout China, officially China says that there are 20 plus uh, million Muslims. However, the figures 
uh, are considerably higher than that because the official census is they actually depress uh, or, or or show them figures of Muslims which are lower. So this be actually a lot more than that. However, even the Chinese census, they say there are more than 20 million Muslims in China. The reason I'm making this video is because China has called something called re-education. What they mean to say is they want to strip off the the identity of Islam, the customs of these people, which are Turk people or Turkistan, Turkistani people, and they want to indoctrinate the ideology, the Chinese, uh, Confucius and ideologies which are native to China. Now, if you know anything about China, China is not a homogenous region. China has multiple ethnicities, religions, people, and so on. But what China is doing is they are specifically targeting the Uyghur Muslims in this region, in the East Turkestan region, to indoctrinate. They're not targeting any other ethnicity whatsoever to make them Chinese. They're specifically targeting the Chinese Muslims. And what they mean by re-education is uh, they, they get these people and they try to indoctrinate their own ideology in, into their hearts and minds. Now understand the Confucius, if you've read anything about Confucius and the old Chinese philosophy and ideology, it is 180 degrees apart from Tawheed of Islam. So this is what, what they, the Chinese call it re-education. It's not re-education, it's actually brainwashing. And we will talk about it later on towards the end. Brothers and sisters, as I've talked about previously in many of my other videos, uh, they are a bunch of people and all they do is they, you know, whenever they get a message on WhatsApp or social media, they tweet it or re-share it or send it on WhatsApp. Do not just forward this video because I'm not here to give you a history lesson. My whole purpose is to make you aware of what is happening with the Chinese people. So please try to read, understand act and follow do something about it simply I don't want you to follow the message and think that you're done with it there are things that you can do and that is my point I want you to do something about it I want you to understand actually there's a misspelling there should be an R there but I want you to understand what I'm talking uh, what I'm talking about and I'm not an expert on on the Chinese history uh, what I've done is done, done some research uh, you know and so on uh, so the history, I might get something wrong, and that's not the point. What I want you to do is, I'm trying to drive you to do something about it. Unfortunately, the inertia of the Muslims, what they do is they follow messages, they share messages, and so on. No, I want you to do this in a sustained manner, because what is happening with these Chinese Muslims is not is, is nothing new. Now, as I'm saying, I grew up in next to them in Pakistan, uh, in Islamabad, and in the north of Pakistan. Uh, I didn't know anything about it. Right, I met a few of these people. We were not told. Now, Pakistan has a very good relationship with China. So one of the reasons is, you know, nobody talks about what's happening in China. We thought, you know, we always say, Pak Jin Dosti Zindabad, you know, Pak, the friendship of Pakistan and China Zindabad, right? Long live uh, Pakistan and China friendship. We didn't know what was happening until we learned about it much later. So this has been ongoing for a long time. So I don't want you to simply forward the message. I don't want you to just read the history and just sit there and not do anything about it. I want you to, you have an opportunity to do something about it. That's what I'm trying to drive here. Now, many of our uh, brothers and sisters, they ask, you know, well, we, we should wait for Muslim leaders or where are the Muslim leaders and we should do something about it. Let me be blatantly clear to you up front. As far as Muslim leaders are concerned in Muslim countries, right, wherever they find a person who absolutely lacks vision, lacks strategy, you know, is biased, bigoted, and the most useless person, they make him the leader of the Muslim countries. It's as simple as that. Specifically to the Arab countries. These guys are not going to get you anywhere. When it comes to the West, and I'm telling you based on my experience, you know, over decades, whether you're dealing with uh, uh, the the... Uh, the mosques in United Kingdom or America or Europe or so on and so forth, they will find the most, the person who lacks vision, lacks drive, lacks strategy, uh, and they will make them the community members or the community leaders of the mosque. My brothers and sisters in Islam, how long is it going to take for us to wake up? These people are more interested in building fancy mosques, changing the carpets of the mosques, or, or doing, you know, elaborate minaret constructions and so on, rather than doing something about communities and doing something about issues that affect us. The same thing is true for the Muslim leaders, a vast majority of them. Again, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying everybody is like that, but generally it is like that. These Muslim leaders are simply 
interested in filling up their own pockets just like these muslim community leaders they're all interested in in you know doing grandiose projects and nothing to do with the community so brothers and sisters don't get disheartened have hope in the mercy of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you as an individual need to act and not rely on other people and you have a lot of freedom and a lot of leeway and you can make a difference when it comes to chinese muslims or muslims who are getting oppressed elsewhere or even people as a muslim we shouldn't have double standards wherever people are getting oppressed human rights uh, are, are being violated you have the ability to do something about it so take charge and do something and not simply watch a video or forward it or anything like that so what can you do let me tell you something about politics and again this is my opinion right if you're a muslim and you try your best to follow islam we are neither liberals nor conservatives we don't fit in any of those labels right if you live in united kingdom you're not labor you're not tory if you live in america you're not republican you're not democrat now i know some people are are uh, have these labels what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told this ummah of rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam that we are the middle ummah we're supposed to go and take the middle path right we need to stand for humanity we need to stand for human rights we need to take we need to stand and support the oppressed so this isn't about taking allegiance to a particular party now a lot of muslims do that fine that is your prerogative however what we need to stand for we need to stand for decency the truth and this is what islam is about now what can you do again if we had good muslim leaders within our community our mosque communities were functioning properly then what will happen is they will organize a meeting with your mp so whenever there's a problem that occurs whether it happens in kashmir or the rohingya muslims or palestine what they will do is immediately organize a meeting with the mp particularly here i'm talking about member of parliaments in britain there are various constituencies where both the, of the dominant parties in united kingdom whether it's labor or conservatives rely on the votes of the muslims so muslims can play a key role here to their member of parliament saying i want this issue raised in the parliament as i've said unfortunately most of the mosques will not do that so it is up to you have a few friends get together in your area and get set an appointment with the with your local member of parliament and say listen i'm your constituents and again i'm saying doesn't matter whether you vote labor or you vote conservatives it doesn't matter you say listen i'm concerned about what china is doing uh, and basically it's been accepted by united nations it's been accepted by amnesty international there's no doubt about it so i'm concerned about it i want you to raise it secondly if you can't do that you can write there's a website called write to them.com go and put your postcode in there if you're in england or united kingdom rather and write to your mp it's a simple letter it will only take you uh, moments put your full details your address where you live say i'm a constituent in this part of the city etc and i want you to raise this then write to jeremy hunt which is the foreign secretary of of britain and say listen i want this raised in the parliament and i want you to do something about it so don't simply sit there and watch this video do something about it uh, inshallah if you're in america then uh, donald trump uh, is basically uh, the, the the has put tariffs on china so what they're looking for is more leverage on what they can do to sanction china so what they've tried to do uh, is there's a there's a bipartisan congressional executive commission in america on china right and it is made up of the of of a senator uh, Marco Rubio and a congressman Chris Smith from America. So again, what what they're trying to do is they've raised their point of view to uh, to Mike Pompeo, uh, and Mark Pompeo has talked about it. Donald Trump and they've specifically mentioned the persecution of Muslims in China. Now, doesn't matter how you feel with, about Donald Trump, but on this particular issue, if you're if you're in America. Do your research, take a look at Bipartisan Congressional Executive Commission on China, meet your congressman, again, you, you know, whichever district you live in, meet your senator, write to them, and you can easily do that, and you can quote this, what I've, what I've mentioned here, and raise your voice. You can do this, it does not cost you anything, all it does is, is a few minutes of your time, inshallah, and spring back into action. And then, 
whether you have social media, continue to raise the issue of Muslims and what is happening in China from a human rights perspective. Make sure you raise awareness, make sure you drive people to do something and not just simply talk. Now what I'm going to do is switch gears and I will talk to you about how Islam got into China and what happened. So historically the Chinese have always traded uh, with the Arabs and the Middle East and various Asian countries. So that trade was always there. When Islam came, uh, there, were, there, was a, uh, there was a Sahabi, radiallahu uh, anhu, Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas. He was the uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. History tells us that he actually visited China three times, right? Uh, first time with uh, several other Sahabis, the second time, and third time in the era of uh, the third caliph of Islam, Uthman radiallahu anhu. And history, uh, there's some dispute about that, whether he passed away in China or not. Some people accept it. So if we take that and he say he passed away in China, China, his uh, his his actually shrine is is still in China. It is called Huai Huai Cemetery. So it is in the Guangzhou province, Huai Huai Cemetery. And basically, this was the time when China was ruled by the Tang Dynasty, and that's how Islam entered. So previously, they had trade relations with the Arab Saad bin Abi Waqas for the first time he officially went to China. So what happened is this is the time when the Arab traders were coming into China. Uh, some accepted Islam and uh, Islam actually entered China. So the Persian word for Arabs is Tazi. Tazi means fresh. So somebody who's fresh, uh, who, who's coming in. So the Persians used to call Arabs. So basically, Islam was making its its way into the Persian lands. So the to the so the Farsi loves was Tazi, and the Chinese adopted that in their language, and they started calling these Muslims, the Arab Muslims originally, Dashi. Uh, in, in Chinese, so saying, look, which is an indication, basically, these are new people that are coming into these lands. So this was the time of the Tang Dynasty, and, and Muslim Islam have just entered into China. Most of the people at this time are actually foreigners. Now, what I want you to pay attention to throughout the history of Islam in China is the loyalty of Muslims in whichever land they migrate to, and you will clearly see this when you see the history of how Muslims migrated to various lands and so on. The next dynasty that came into China was Song Dynasty. Now this is the Song Dynasty right here, and they had warfare with the Liao uh, side of China, which is right there. So what the Song people needed is they needed warriors who can fight on their behalf to Liao. So what happened is, says Shen Song, who was one of the emperors of Song Dynasty, in 1070, what he did is he invited 5,300 Arab men from Bukhara to fight on his behalf to Liao. And basically, because these Muslims were experienced in warfare, they fought from his side to the Liao. And when they were successful 10 years later, 10,000 more Muslims came into China. So this is the first time when these uh, 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 Turkish people or Turk people are coming into China from outside. So we still don't have a massive Chinese influx to Islam, but what we have is a massive influx of foreign Muslims into China. So one of the Amirs of these, uh, uh, of these uh, people who came to fight uh, on behalf of the Song Dynasty, his name was Prince Amir Sayyid. The Chinese call it Sufair. Okay, there's a possibility that his name was actually Sufair in Arabic, and it got China. It got uh, you know mixed up with the local dialect, so they call him Sufair. So because he was the Amir of all these people who were migrating and fighting on behalf of the Song Dynasty, he is actually regarded as the father of the Chinese Muslims. So this is the first time the Chinese dropped their word Dashi which is foreign and based basically Muslims were helping them fight against the Leo. So this was the Song Dynasty um, and Muslims are now coming into massive numbers into China. Next we get into the Ming Dynasty. So once again in China you got the internal warfare going on um, and what the Ming Dynasty needed is they were expanding and what they encouraged is large immigration and not just Muslims of anybody foreigners who could come in and people with knowledge, people experience, people with uh, a lot of warfare skills 
so large amounts of Muslims came into this land uh, and Muslims contributed to the expanding Chinese Empire and one of the things the Muslims contributed to was this catapult so if you can imagine at that time warfare used to be the people used to uh, encase themselves or, or surround themselves within fortresses castles to protect themselves so you needed something to break the walls and the Muslims they uh, they contributed to this and Muslims uh, you know they basically generated this catapult in, in China and it became one of the weapons uh, and basically in the Chinese language is called it was called Huai Huai Paro and what this catapult did is actually uh, Muslims became uh, dear uh, to the dynasty because they were contributing scientifically and so on and so forth so you can see the progression the Chinese they they first they asked the Muslims to come and help them and, and then they were happy and now they the Muslims are contributing to the society as far as technology is concerned uh, and everybody's happy uh, and life goes on from the Ming Dynasty onwards. So because the Ming, the contribution of Muslims towards the Ming Dynasty was significant, Muslims owed a lot of uh, loyalty. They had a lot of loyalty to the Ming Dynasty. And that's going to play a significant part in the next cycle, as you will see. Right before turning the page, I noticed I had the date wrong. So basically, the Ming Dynasty was roughly 1370 to 1650. Moving along. So what happened is then we get to the Qing Dynasty. Now, what happened during the Qing dynasties, unlike the previous two, which were more interested in, uh, in, in basically uh, looking and expanding, the Qing dynasty were more isolationists. So what they did is they basically closed the ports. Uh, and and they basically uh, became isolationists. Now, as a result of that, there were two things. So the immigration into China stopped because the ports were closed. However, the Muslims that were uh, they were already there within a few hundred years because the Qing Dynasty lasted hundreds of years. Uh, they became internalized and they became Chinese and they adopted the Chinese customs and so on and so forth. However, one more thing happened. Basically, the Muslims were quite loyal to the previous Ming dynasty because these were these were Muslims who were educated, they brought in their skills, they brought in their sciences and technologies. So they actually fought the uh, you know parts of the Qing dynasty. Qing dynasty had taken over from Ming dynasty. So the Muslims were loyal to Ming. So as a result of the loyalty the Muslims had to the previous dynasty, they actually fought uh, the Qing dynasty. They resisted it. Uh, and the Muslims were massacred at a number of times because of their loyalty to the Ming. So they were they were uh, believed to be suspicious because they uh, because of the loyalty to the previous one. And because of these massacres, there came upon a time that the Muslims basically started migrating outside of China. So remember, the immigration into China stopped because of, uh, you know, it's not encouraged and it's going, taking an isolationist route. So the Muslims are now leaving China. Not only Muslims, Chinese people were also leaving uh, China. So what you had is uh, what we called Chin Ho migration to Thailand. So a lot of these people started moving away from China and in, in, into Thailand. So they had to go through Burma and some other locations and so forth. So this Chin Ho migration, a vast majority of these people were actually Muslims and they today they live in Thailand. Uh, this migration uh, was such so widespread that in the middle of uh, 1866 or thereabouts, I believe, in New Zealand, there was something called the Otago Gold Rush. So what happened is people thought there was lots of gold in this area and prospectors from all over the world came looking for gold. And the census of that time actually list Chinese Muslims in New Zealand. Uh, who were actually prospecting for gold. So basically, Muslims were persecuted and they're now beginning to move out of China uh, because of isolationist uh, regimes and, and Chinese uh, uh, civilization or, or riches of China are in decline. So people are now leaving China. But as a side effect of that, but because it's isolationist, uh, because of these two or 300 years, the Muslims are now beginning to internalize the Chinese language. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, mixed race marriages and all this stuff going on uh, from, from the Muslims who were immigrants before into the Chinese society. So China is now in decline. I mean, the, 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 uh, it, it is in decline. So what happens in 1911, the modern uh, or, or the precursor to the modern Chinese state, the Chinese Republic established. And this is actually done by a, a guy called Sun Yat-sen. So he established the Chinese Republic in 1911. Now, Chinese at that time, what he thought of is he thought China has Han, 
Chinese people, the Huai, the Muslims, the Meng or the Mongols, and the Tibetan people. So what he tried to do is he, he enshrined this in the law that basically all of these people have equal rights and he wanted to bring race relations uh, back together for, to progress China. That was his intention. So one of the things he did is he made sure that, you know, try to bring all of these different ethnicity, ethnicities together. So remember what I said at the beginning of this presentation, that China is not a homogenous culture it is not a homogeneous bunch of people you have various ethnicities and mixes within china so when the chinese republic was established in 1911 that's what sun yat-sen tried to do is he basically try to bring all these people together now remember the muslim immigrants to china are inherently loyal they've already paid the price once for the loyalty so then what happens 1911 chinese republic starts next thing you know you have first world war and in the second world war in the second world war the most important region uh, area that i want to talk about is the is the japanese chinese war between 1937 to 1945 this is the second uh, japanese chinese war and once again as you can see from this picture the muslims rise up to uh, actually fight on behalf of china against the japanese now the japanese committed untold atrocities and massacres on china and in Burma. As you've heard from the previous lectures, my father was stationed in the Second World War in Burma, uh, and basically uh, he was part of the Indian Army, and uh, you know, basically uh, the trenches were carpet bombed, and his leg was injured, and so on. Uh, Japanese did untold massacres in China, which uh, is, is well-known history. So one of the most well-known one, and I want you to read about this, is called the Nanking Massacre, or the Nanking Rape. So the, the Japanese basically destroyed areas and villages upon villages and, and raped women and did all kinds of stuff in that region during the second chinese japanese wars so if you can see the muslims were loyal to they were chinese and they were fighting the japanese because the japanese were coming into their land so the japanese also not only they i mean they, the japanese didn't just single out muslims they actually massacred chinese and the muslims were massacred as a result of it in large numbers as well because they were fighting on behalf of china one thing I came across is this guy is interesting. So this guy, his name was Rosen, and he was uh, the legation secretary of the German embassy. And he wrote a letter, which is still present today in the Berlin Museum. So he writes about, uh, about what happened in one particular occasion. And he says, on December 13, about 30 soldiers came to a Chinese house at number 5 Yusing Lakao in the southeastern part of Nanking. Remember the Nanking massacre or Nanking rape? and demanded entrance. The door was opened by the landlord, a Mohammedan named Ha, meaning a Muslim named Ha. They killed him immediately with a revolver and also Mrs. Ha, who knelt before them after Ha's death, begging him not to kill anyone else. Mrs. Ha asked them why they killed her husband and they shot her. Mrs. Saya was dragged out of from under a table in the guest hall where she had tried to hide with her one-year-old baby. After being stripped and raped by one or more men, she was bayoneted in the chest and then had a bottle thrust into her vagina. This letter is still present in the Berlin Museum today. And he specifically lists this atrocity and is obviously he, he says that this person was a Muslim. So the Japanese did untold atrocities in China and in Burma. So why were the Muslims the target of it? As you can see from the pictures, the Muslims were actually fighting to protect China because they were Chinese. So this 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 is a, a history of the Chinese Muslims. What happens next? So basically 1949, China becomes People's Republic of China. By this time, centuries of war, exploitation, colonization, China is in disarray. Uh, they're very poor. They cannot. They can hardly feed their own population. Things are really, really bad. So China is is a poor country. It's coming up uh, in 1949. What happens in 1966 to 90? Before I talk about that, when China took independence, a lot of their laws and constitution were based on the old Soviet Republic. So they tried to follow the Soviet five-year law. They tried to follow uh, the Soviet policies for economic reforms and so on, and it wasn't really working out. So they had what what the outside world calls the Cultural Revolution. So what happened in the Cultural Revolution from 1966 to 1976? It, they tried to force communism on the people of China by force. So as I told you, China is a multi-ethnic country. So what they tried to do is force communism. And they thought the only way 
to to actually uh, go and progress in this world is to destroy the four olds and what do they call it they called old customs old culture old habits old ideas basically destroyed there was nothing written as to what is an old custom what is an old culture what is an old habit they just simply got out there and tried to erase history of whatever they considered to be old because they thought it was an impediment to progress of china by 1976 you know or a few years before this this cultural revolution was coming to an end however an incident happened that has its implications in history uh, and it still has uh, it basically shapes the relationships of muslims china with the uh, non-muslim chinese what actually happened was the government was gradually giving independence for some or partial religious freedom there was a muslim village uh, Xijian or Shadian in English basically the, they were not permitted to open their mosque what they tried to do is these Muslims they boarded uh, trains uh, several hundred to a thousand of them exact numbers not known and they wanted to go to the capital to protest and seek permission to have the mosque of the village opened they they couldn't get there and then what happened is 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 they said okay because of this oppression because of the lack of religious freedom what we're going to do is we're going to go into the garrisons and we're going to capture the weapons of the chinese army and we're going to try to protect themselves because these muslims thought that the chinese will crack down on muslims what the chinese government did is they sent 10000 soldiers with, uh, with uh, armed with the with mig uh, jets which they'd gotten from russia and they bombed village after village after village of muslims right and they suppressed this uh, uh, this uh, basically they were standing for the human rights for the mosque to be opened in large numbers they suppressed them uh, with the most uh, utmost brutality okay most of these chinese soldiers were not chinese muslims they were han chinese so that massacre is still active in the memories of most chinese muslims who are alive today that happened in around 1974 i believe it's called the, the Xijian incident and that what sowed the seeds between the army and the muslims because the army thought these people were rebelling against us they took us weapons uh, so they suppressed it they, they like you know a, a government this is what the governments do in, uh, when they have power they try to suppress the rebellion and crush it at any cost possible that is the, the 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 seed of the modern problem between the chinese army and the muslims so what happened from 1980s onwards so china uh, after the cultural revolution china china began to open up what they did is they they began to give limited permissions for religious freedom they also tried to open up their mind if you look at the the moderate economic prosperity of china most of the historians economic historians say that the seeds of it lay in the 1980s so what china is doing is opening up its market opening up its resources uh, trying to feed its population and so on so they had a huge energy demand all of a sudden this area which is east turkestan which is mostly the muslim area is extremely rich in oil and gas so it became a priority for the chinese to actually make sure that these uh, oil and gas reserves are tapped into and utilized for the progress of china so they tried to do certain things what they tried to do is send in the chinese army which as i talked about were mostly han into these areas to secure some of these oil fields second thing they tried to do is they wanted to make sure uh, that basically they change the complexion of this area so what they tried to do is they tried to send in migration forced migrations into the area to change demographics there's nothing wrong with migration muslims got there as, as you know hundreds of years ago into china uh, but it wasn't to change the complexity of the area wasn't forced one of the things uh, that you need to understand is there's a place uh, there's a city called kashkar uh, now if you read uh, the poetry of allama iqbal uh, you probably remember the the stanza where he talked about you know uh, how you know as far as the ummah is concerned ek hu muslim haram ki pasbani ke liye we are one ummah to protect the haramain Neel ke sahil se le kar tabakha ke Kashgar, from the island of Neel to Kashgar. So Kashgar, the city itself, is basically extremely important 
to the to the uh, Tur Turkistani Muslims. Al also, it is an identity of Muslims of the area. What the Chinese tried to do is they tried to dominate that by changing the mix of Kashgar by introducing multiple trade zones. This is how they started in the 80s. They started creating trade zones, which they still do to this day. The, this is the Chinese way. So that changed the ethnic mix of the city, which the the Chinese Muslims regarded as as quite important to their cultural way of life, and this is when the backlash started against. Uh, so they had to secure this area, which had oil and gas uh, regions. Uh, they sent in the army. They tried to do forced migration to change the complexion of the of the society and the complexion and the demographics of it. And then we had uh, the the 9/11 war on terror. The suppression of Muslims, as you know, has been going on since the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and so on. It's nothing new. But what 9-11 did, it gave an excuse to the Chinese government to actually label this uh, uh, this resistance of Muslims or the demand of Muslims to give them their human rights as uh, and and target them as uh, extremists and terrorists, and they started this crackdown. So from that point on, things are blatant and things are right in your face. So at this point, the Chinese, a few days ago, the news came out about these re-education camps. Uh, the Chinese haven't even tried to deny it. They say, yes, they are. What we're trying to do is we're trying to purge these people of their extremist ideology, of their extremist methods. So they don't even try to hide it anymore. They say, yeah, we got re-education camps for one million people. Imagine that, one million people. And we're trying to re-educate them. Uh, we're trying to de-radicalize them uh, of of their in of their uh, extremists and stuff. So what they do in these re-education camps uh, is is they try to uh, uh, you know there's there's uh, free mixing, there's dancing, uh, there's even serving of alcohol. Uh, men are not allowed uh, to to uh, you know to portray any signs of Islam, and neither are women. And that's what these re-education camps are actually about. And the permission of that has been given by 9-11. So basically, yeah, we have extremists and terrorists. Let's crack down on them uh, and, and move on. So this half an hour discussion was to just to give you a background of Islam in China, how we got to where we are. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to add an interview of a brother who's an activist. Um, uh, and his interview was given to a South African radio station. So please listen to it. Now you know the full history of it. He's, inshallah, uh, ethnic uh, and he has more lo uh, local knowledge than me obviously jazakallah khair assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh please listen to the interview yawmun jadeed with muhammad sheikh and zahir basa monday to friday 7 to 9 a.m central african time live from our durban studios 8.37 a.m. Central African time. This is CII Radio coming to you live from our Durban studios, broadcasting across the world. Now, China has been accused of allegedly detaining up to 1 million uh, Uyghurs and other Turkic minority Muslim groups in its Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region under what UN experts have called the pretext of countering terrorism and religious extremism. Beijing, however, denies allegations of mass detention and discrimination saying the strict security measures in Xinjiang are aimed at preventing what it calls the three forces, separatism, extremism, and terrorism. Joining us on the line to unpack this important issue is Brother Abdul Ghani Sabit, a Uyghur activist and a researcher. Brother Abdul Ghani, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Shukran for joining us. Wa alaikum assalam wa Thank you very much for giving this opportunity. Thank you. Barakallah. And uh, speak to us about the current situation on the ground in Xinjiang, uh, in the autonomous region. What exactly is taking place right now? Actually, uh, like Xinjiang, it's called the, the like Uyghur side, East Turkestan. It has been an occupied country by Communist China since 1949. So the, after occupation, the Chinese government has committed uh, systematically genocide of Uyghurs especially after the 11th September, the Chinese government used so-called war on terrorism to crack down an extremely harsh policy against the Uyghurs and other the Turk people in East Turkestan. And of course, one of the things we do know is the Chinese government has limited and censored information that gets into the autonomous region, but also information that leaves the region uh, itself. What is the current state of censorship like in the province? 
Sorry again. Can you tell us about the sense, uh, the, the state of censorship? We know that a lot of information that is available to the uh, Uyghur community in this part of China uh, is restricted. What are these restrictions currently like? Look, uh, no, brother. Uh, for example, the East, East Turkestan is actually like, a, how can I say, become like a, a, a prison after China's occupation, for example. The many years, like uh, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, and other NGO organizations, also some government, uh, the many Chinese government to allow that uh, journalists and independent journalists to check what really happens there. But Chinese government always not a lot of to them. Anyone who want to, for example, any journalists who want to visit in East Turkestan, the government never, never give, give them any permission. Because the Chinese government, you know, East Turkestan is in, 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 uh, occupied country. The Chinese government's main game is to destroy the Uyghur culture, Uyghur language, and the Uyghur nation. Uh, because the Chinese government want East Turkestan forever as a part of China. So that's why there are a lot of atrocities which carry out, carried out by Chinese government. For example, like after the 11th September, the Chinese government used so-called war and terror. And for the Uyghurs, not allowed to study their own language at the primary school, at the university, for example. And also the Chinese government, uh, every year, every chance to demolish the Uyghurs culture, for example, all the buildings, and for example, any Uyghurs uh, who have, for the year, uh, the Uyghurs traditionally closes, or, for example, that Islamic closes to the government, labels them separatists and the terrorists, for example. Anyone who has family abroad, for example, just labels them, you have, like, links to the separatist group, blah, blah, something like this. Actually, the Uyghurs in Istanbul is an Eastern occupied country. The Uyghurs want to get back, uh, reestablish the country, but Chinese government labels them separatists, and Chinese government, you know what? At the moment, the so-called war, like a terrorism, so government just to use some so-called one terror for their own benefit to crack down, for example, kill, torture. There are a lot of such crimes, brothers. That's why the media, and not a lot, because Chinese government know that if they, like, independent journalists like you, uh, for example, just came to East Pakistan, they know what the Chinese government really doing against Uyghurs. Chinese government don't want to like uh, the crime to the, the publish on the media. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about the United Nations General Assembly that's currently taking place in New York. Is it likely that this issue will be brought up perhaps by other states during this time? Uh, it's, it's a very difficult question, brother. Uh, for example, like Years and years, the Uyghurs like we demand from the Muslim uh, the countries and the Muslim scholars, uh, for example, uh, like the Uyghurs in the East Turkestan people are Muslim, and also Chinese government violates human rights, uh, rights for the Uyghurs and other uh, Turkic people. And we say some as a stand up for us as like the human rights issue. But the Muslim government, it has, uh, it has very, it has, it has very good relationship with the Chinese government, and they don't want to hurt the Chinese government, and they need Chinese technology. And also they have internal problems, that's why they don't want to talk about the Uyghur issue. Uh, but we demand the Muslim government, for example, must be stand up uh, just to choose a right side. And also, for example, like uh, United States and also like uh, Human Rights Watch and some NGO, for example, brought the issue on the table and demand the Chinese government to stop the ethnic genocide and kill people. The, until now, the Chinese government sometimes says, yes, that's a real education camp. We did nothing. There are three evil forces, for example, like uh, extremism, uh, terrorism, for example. Uh, all of them have a bunch of lies from the Chinese government. So, for example, until now, some governments like the United States... Just... And also Canada, no, 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 no. I had Canada, for example, they brought this issue on the table. But now we don't think so. It's not really happened. And, and um, when we're looking at this uh, entire issue, of course, for Muslims across the world, this is uh, uh, something that's very saddening. It's something that's very disheartening. But what can we do in our own respective countries to try and help the uh, Uyghur community? 
for for example, uh, like you know, like uh, the, the NGO, like uh, people like you, brother, like you, for example, uh, learned uh, the Turks and history, uh, learned the Uyghur people and other Turkic people, and also the history of, China, for example, people in Tibet. So the Chinese government, you know, is very greedy. I mean, like, uh, if you learn about the Uyghurs and the history and what really happened here, and you can talk like a radio, like a TV, like a journal, like a newspaper, and explain them how the Chinese government, like, kill and kidnap and torture the Uyghurs and commit an ethnic genocide in East Pakistan, that's a right article, a write a book, brother. And also, like, uh, uh, make a big organization and conference, uh, spread the issue among the Muslims, spread the issue among the humanity. Shukran, Brother Abdul Ghani, for joining us this morning, for helping to uh, unpack this issue and creating awareness as well. We really appreciate it. Barakallahu Fikum. Thank you very much. Barakallahu Fikum, brother. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. That was Brother Abdul Ghani joining us this morning. He is a Uyghur activist and researcher and, of course, providing some valuable insights into the current plight of the embattled Uyghur population in a China, ethnic Muslim minority that are experiencing much harshness at the hands of the Chinese communist regime. 8.45 a.m. Central African time. Yawmun Jadid with Muhammad Sheikh and Zaheer Basa. Monday to Friday, 7 to 9 a.m. Central African time. Live from our Durban studios.